I'd rather feel in black than African American. Because our, our Africans don't even f with us. Wow. Because they don't. And Americans do? Well, you're American, Mace. You're, you're born in America. When you go to the Olympics, and when I say yeah. African American, you over there, they call us Yankees and all that. They f us, but they, they. I believe the proper word is Akata. The following program is rated TV MAL. It contains strong language and is intended only for mature audiences. The first um, is this video we have of Cameron posted by Dr. Umar Johnson. Now, this video is, Cam is from Cameron and Mace's podcast. It is what it is. Uh, and in this particular, particular video, Cam pretty much states uh, what a lot of prominent voices on YouTube have already pretty much uh, made known. Most notably, Yvette Carnell, Antonio Moore, Tariq Nasheed. Uh, they have all been saying for some years now. And what we know to be a fact in that is that for real, for real, we're not Africans. We are Americans. And of course, this triggered the biggest pan-African race grifter in the entire universe, none other than Dr. Umar Johnson. So without wasting any more time, let's get to the video and then we'll break it down. One second, we're going to get to it. Here we go. All right, so here's Cam. A few minutes in. Um, I'd rather feel in black than African-American. Because our, our Africans don't even fuck with us. Wow. Because they don't. And Americans do? Well, you're American, Mace. You're, you're born in America. When you go to the Olympics, and when I say yeah. African-American, you go over there, they call us Yankees and all that. They fuck with us, but they... they. I believe the proper word is Akata. We're not, we're not from the motherland. We're from, the Amer we're from America. So I would always say I'm a black American. When we go to the Olympics as a country and somebody mm -hmm. black is fighting from the United States, you don't say African American. Mm -hmm. You say American. You don't even put a color on it. It's an American fighter yeah. fighting a European fighter or China, China or... Uh, Japanese That's or good. anything. You, you're you known in the Olympics as an American. It doesn't matter what color you are. You're an American fighting against somebody from Cameroon or um, Senegal, whatever. The point being is they don't categorize it when it's world competition, but when it's other shit, it needs to be categorized. So I consider myself a black American. I don't consider myself African American. And shout out to all my niggas in Africa. Much love. But y'all don't consider us real Africans. Y'all don't. All right, and here we go. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with what Cameron has to say. No disrespect to the Africans, but you know, ones that'll tell you the truth, they'll tell you. It is what it is. And I don't even see that as an insult. Now, of course. Dr. Umar Johnson has something to say about it. So let's get to that. Let's get to Umar's comments. Here we go. All right. So Umar uh, responded under the video. Dear my brother Cameron, I must respectfully disagree with your logic. America isn't even 250 years old. To say you're not African is synonymous with saying your people have no history beyond July 4th, 1776 or August 20th, 1619. Do you not find it odd that we are the only people in the United States who routinely and publicly renounce our land of origin? Now, let me stop right there because that's not true. That's not true at all. And shout out to my sister, Miss CB. She says, we want to talk about cat. Everybody's talking about cat. We can get into some cat later, but I got to handle business first. Um, so anyway, he says you don't find anyone else to do that. That's not true. Um, the original settlers that came over from the UK or England or London, whatever you want to call it. They don't consider themselves from England. They left England under bad terms, established a new country, and that's what they go by. Ironically, that's the same thing with us. We left Africa, some of us, under bad terms. The rest of us were already indigenous to the United States. That's a whole nother conversation. For all intents and purposes, we're going to keep it simple. 
We left Africa under bad terms. We left Africa as prisoners and victims sold over here by our own people. We'll get, at, we'll get into that a little later. But just to make it clear, we were here as slaves before America was even a country. So if anything, you we could consider ourselves original Americans. But let's get back to the point. All right. So he says, not only do Chinese, Indians, Arabs, Latinos identify with their ancestral homeland, but they also contribute financially to their mother country's empowerment. You mentioned the Olympics. Are you aware that many American citizens regularly represent their ancestral homelands in the sporting contest between the nations? Yes, they are American citizens, but when it comes time uh, for war or competition, they stand unapologetically with the people under the flag of their mother country. Okay, so my question to Umar Johnson is, what's our mother country? You can't answer that damn question because nobody knows. It's like people try to use Africa uh, as a country and a continent. Like it's interchangeable. Nobody goes to the Olympics and represents Asia. Nobody does that. So with all due respect, I have no problem with anyone from Africa. I love Africa. I love Africans. But we're American. And it's nothing wrong with saying I'm an American. You can't even tell me what... what country from africa you come from you can't tell me that so anyway let's get back into uh, dr umar's statement cam please don't make general statements like africans don't f with us that was a general statement i wouldn't have made that statement but anyway that's cam it's true many do not but as someone who regularly spends times on the mother continent and throughout the african diaspora i can assure you there are many more who do support us we can't be so dismissive of our African brethren when we never dismiss white America after her 400 plus year dehumanization and genocide campaign against American African people. Now that's that's BS. That's BS. Have you visited Africa as of yet? If so, how many different countries have you toured? Please don't draw conclusions based off a few poor interactions with some politically unconscious, self-hating Afropeans here in America. Remember, America doesn't allow the pan-Africanist minded brothers and sisters from the African diaspora to enter this country. She only tolerates the colorblind anti-American African who will not join forces with us, with us to cross her borders. The real African revolutionaries are in Africa. They haven't been in Harlem since the days of Marcus Garvey. United we stand and divided we fall, my brother. All right, so that was Umar Johnson's statements. Um, real quick, what I want to do is I want to play Cam's statements one more time, just real quick, before we get into the commentary, but I, I because I, it, there's some points that, uh, he, that he really made that I want to drive home. So let's do that real quick, one more time, and we'll get into the commentary. All right. All right. So here's Cam again. That's that. A few minutes in. Um, I'd rather feel in black than African American. Because I, I, Africans don't even fuck with us. Wow. Because they don't. And Americans do? Well, you're American, Mace. You're, you're born in America. When you go to the Olympics, and when I say yeah. African American, you go over there, they call us Yankees and all that. They fuck with us, but they they we're not we're not from the motherland. We're from the Amer we're from America. So I always say I'm a black American. When we go to the Olympics as a country, and somebody mm -hmm. black is fighting from the United States, you don't say African American, mm -hmm. you say American. You don't even put a color on it. It's an American fighter yeah. fighting a European fighter or China China or uh Japanese That's or good. Anything you you're known in the Olympics as an American. It doesn't matter what color you are. You're an American fighting against somebody from Cameroon. Or All right, so we'll stop it right there. We'll stop it right there. And I want to make one more point. Here's what I never hear out of Umar Johnson and people who complain whenever we consider ourselves Americans. You never hear Umar Johnson 
criticize Jamaicans, Bohemians, um, all the black people down in the Caribbean in these um, countries, you never hear them criticize a, a Jamaican for being a Jamaican. Jamaicans ain't originally from Jamaica. Jamaicans are from West Africa also. Brazilians are, are not originally from Brazil. They're from West Africa also. But they came here and established a country. And that's what they claim at this point. I just find it utterly, utterly ridiculous. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't hear a Jamaican person call themselves uh, African Jamaican. They're just a Jamaican, even though Jamaica was started by the UK. But for some for some reason, it's a problem when Black Americans do it. It's a big problem we do it. Now to Cam's point, my ancestors have been in this country at least since before we liberated ourselves from British control. Now, how do I know that? Because um, my father, my grandmother, and my grandfather on my father's side are all buried in the same cemetery in Leesburg, Virginia. You can go to that cemetery today and you can see all my ancestors traced back to the Re Revolutionary War. There's also a monument to the soldiers that were in the Revolutionary War and in the Civil War at that cemetery. I can trace my ancestors back. But anyway, to Cam's point, we've been in this country since before we liberated ourselves from British control. In fact, most black folks in this country have a similar time frame with their lineage. So to walk around here, considering yourself to be uh, African in 2024 is not only not a flex it's outright stupid no disrespect to my African brothers and sisters but they know niggas in Africa would give their left leg to get their families up out of there the average African on the continent is living in squalor and that ain't no, no offense I'm not trying to be offensive but it is a fact that a third of Africans that's one a third of 1.4 billion people are living in extreme poverty. And when they say extreme poverty, that's classified as families living under $2 a day. Now, extreme poverty in the U.S., what's that? That's $13,000 a year for a family of four. So it ain't even close. And that's not even counting the government assistance that you get if you make that much money. So y'all can go ahead and, and be dumb and claim a continent that don't claim you all you want. But in actuality, you're falling for the trick bag. There is no country in the entire world where black folks are thriving more than they do in the United States. What's even crazier is most of the countries don't even fuck with each other like that. And then it'd be tribes within these countries that have age old beefs. <laughs> So what I'm saying is there ain't no fixing the majority of this African situation. And this is largely because of the greed that they've practiced for the last thousand or some odd years. Now, it's not the to total of Africa. I'm more, though, I'm more so specifically talking about West Africa. Because even prior to the transatlantic slave trade, they were selling their own people to Arabs. As a matter of fact, in some countries, it's still going on to this day. Secondly, you niggas don't even know what country you even came from in Africa, as I said earlier. It's a huge continent with thousands of different tribes and thousands of different subcultures. So to try to just claim all the claim all of them as like this one blanket culture is ridiculous. And, and, the, and the people from those cultures and countries don't really fuck with that ideology either because it 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 to a degree it, it lessens uh what they're about when you just blanket them all now speaking of tribes and subcultures i want to direct your attention to one of the most popular uh west african tribes now i did a video on this a while back uh when that movie um the woman king came out and they were praising the, the, the homie tribe 
Now, who's the Dahomey tribe? The Dahomey tribe was one of the most vicious tribes in West Africa. And they were most known for capturing, killing, raping, pillaging, and selling off millions and millions of their own people into the uh, transatlantic slave trade. So, real quick, I got a, two quick videos on that, and then we'll keep it moving. All right, so let's get to this. The Atlantic slave trade was started by the Portuguese in the mid 15th century. Originally, slaves were taken to Europe, but this changed in 1526, when the first Portuguese ships carried slaves across the Atlantic to their new American colonies. However, the vision of Europeans landing on an African shore, frightening a tribe of natives into submission, and dragging them in chains to their ship is not representative of what happened for most slaves. Some slaves were indeed taken in European slave raids, but the vast majority were sold to the Europeans by other Africans. The European arrival in West Africa came at the same time as the collapse of the Mali Empire. Various splinter states scrapped Real quick, I want to I want to stop right there. Pay attention to what he just said: the collapse of the Mali Empire. Now, if you're not uh, familiar with the Mali Empire, the Mali Empire was headed by y'all's favorite uh, African uh, folktale hero, which is Mansa Musa, who they say was the richest man in the world. Okay, fine. Um, from from what I hear, that's a fact. But do you know how Mansa Musa became the richest man in the world? Do you know? Mansa Musa was the biggest slave trader in the world. That's how he acquired all of his wealth. So you Negroes keep running around here listening to these race grifters glorifying slave traders in countries who actively participated in slave traders. It makes you look stupid. It makes you look really stupid. But let's continue scrambled over, over each, each other, other to seize, seize territory, territory for themselves. For themselves. The, Europeans, the Europeans with their firearms offered, offered these competing rulers a potential advantage, advantage over their enemies. enemies. In, in turn, turn, the huge, huge amounts of captives that these kingdoms acquired in their wars were useful currency to trade with the Europeans. Additionally, the other goods like cloth and ceramics that the Europeans brought were status symbols that the new African elite could use to showcase their wealth and power. Different, different peoples. peoples so there we have it <laughs> there we have it <laughs> they were selling you off to buy fucking designer clothes basically nothing tangible they just wanted to look flyer than the rest of the niggas on the continent let's go back i just want to make sure i just want to make sure we hear that correctly europeans Additionally, the other goods like cloth and ceramics that the Europeans brought were status symbols that the new African elite could use to showcase their wealth and power. Different peoples responded in different ways to the opportunities of European slave trading. The Kingdom of Congo made contact with Portuguese explorers in 1483 and traded thousands of slaves every year. The slaving relationship between the two powers was sophisticated and mutually beneficial. For example, Congolese King Alfonso I saw the Portuguese as a useful outlet for the excess slaves he acquired during his expansionary wars, and he was an eager participant in slave trading. However, he also asserted his own power over it in 1526, by forcing Portugal to submit to his legal framework for slavery, which governed how exactly someone might be enslaved, and provided protections for those who were not legitimately enslaved mostly his own subjects taken by criminal raiders or opportunists. A similar enthusiasm was seen among the various Akan peoples of modern Nigeria. They occupied an area known as the Gold Coast. Now, for, for the, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the Dahomey tribe because that's, that's the most interesting here. Let's get to them. Of all the slaving states of Africa, none is more infamous than Dahomey. 
First emerging around 1600 along the southern coast of modern-day Nigeria, Dahomey soared to prominence under the warrior king Agaja in the early 18th century. Dahomey's ace in the hole was a well-trained and well-organized standing army, perhaps as large as 50,000 men or more at its height, which Agaja used to conquer the kingdoms of Alada and Wida in the 1720s. Alada and Wida were prolific slave-trading kingdoms, with tens of thousands of slaves passing through their ports. Dahomey's consolidated control of so many slave ports made it one of the most formidable slaving powers in history. The colossal army pushed Dahomey towards slavery for two additional reasons. Firstly, its military culture discouraged men from non-military careers, meaning that slaves were needed to carry out other jobs like agriculture. Secondly, a standing army had to be kept occupied or else it might grow restless and rebel. So Dahomey was constantly attacking other neighboring powers or sending out slave raids to bring back captives. The result was a colossal slave population. According to some estimates, by the 19th century, two-thirds of the kingdom's population were enslaved people. Slavery was so endemic to Dahomeyan society that one scholar remarked it's difficult to determine whether Dahomey was a slaving gang turned into a state or a state that existed purely for the sake of slaving. So the, like uh, these people were just the, these people were just making slaves out of everybody. They were punch drunk on the money that they were making off slavery. They were punch drunk off of it. And, 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 and I'll get to this a little later uh, in depth, but this was the downfall of African civilization. This was the downfall. They got too freaking greedy. Slaves weren't just laborers and domestic servants in Dahomey, but became woven into the political fabric of the society. Ownership of slaves became a status symbol for Dahomeyan elites, as it did for others in West Africa. This led to tension between the king and the elites who fought for control over the slave trade. Although it is often characterized as a royal monopoly, even the absolute power of the monarch was not enough to rein in elites who established power bases of their own thanks to their trading of slaves. Slaves also became a part of Dahomeyan religion. The annual customs of Dahomey were a day of rituals and public celebration involving military parades, political debates, and human sacrifice of slaves. So not only were they capturing their own people, as you say, Dr. Umar, and selling them off into slavery, they were throwing parades once a year and sacrificing them. How is this any different then what happened over here in America? How's this any different? Why aren't we petitioning these countries for reparations as well? Let's go. To appease the spirits and protect the kingdom for another year. Hundreds, Hundreds of slaves, of slaves were, killed, were killed, usually, usually with decapitation. decapitation. And in some, in some years, years, as many as 4,000 people, people were sacrificed on a single day. 4,000 people in one day. Now, <laughs> listen, man. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, hip to what happened in the 17th, 18th, early 1900th, the 19th century in America. But I can't think of, I can't think of one day besides maybe the Tulsa massacre where 4,000 people were killed just because they thought God wanted them to kill them. They were killing, they were killing our ancestors. Africans were killing our ancestors because they thought it was pleasing to God. That's how sick this gets. A similar, a similar display, display of mass, mass sacrifice was required, was required for the funeral, the funeral of the king, king. and might and occur, occur on a smaller scale, scale for any, any number of other rituals or social or events. Dahomey remained committed to slavery even as the European powers began their crusade against it. In 1880. So, as, as we hear right there, the Dahomey were still illegally trading slaves even after the European nations stopped slavery and 
made it illegal. The homies were still dealing slaves. As a matter of fact, you don't believe me? Let's move on to the next video. Uh, this is actual uh, testimony from an African who was stolen in one of the last slave raids. Um, after This was after slavery was legal and all that shit. He was stolen and sent to America from the Dahomey tribe. Let's go. Box below. Oluwale Kosola, a.k.a. Kujo Lewis, was one of the last survivors of the Atlantic slave trade. He took the voyage from Africa along with 115 others, and they arrived here in the U.S. in 1860 in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile is home to an African-American treasure many people are unaware of. Africatown and a man whose legacy lives on today. Kajo Kazula Lewis is a prime example of hidden history during this Black History Month. A cast iron image pays tribute to the last surviving member of the final slave ship that came into America. Cut Joe Lewis is one of more than a hundred slaves captured in West Africa and brought here on the Clotilda in 1859. After a mobile businessman made a bet, he could sneak them in illegally. Later in life, in 1927, he shared his story. Now to the people that say none of us come from Africa, or only a few of us come from Africa, you can't deny the documentation. Fortunately, he lived to be 95 years old, so he was able to share his story. The United States banned the importation of slaves in 1808, but we didn't ban slavery in the United States until December of 1865 with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And one of the things that means is that the vast majority of the slaves that were freed had been in the United States for many generations, and their history was largely lost to time. The dynamics of slavery means that the families had been broken up and even oral histories were largely lost. And that leaves a specific gap in the historical record because there are very few first-hand accounts of what life was like before the Middle Passage. But there is at least one extraordinary exception. Oluale Kazola, who was otherwise known as Kajo Lewis, was born in what is today Benin in West Africa around 1840. And like millions of others, his tribe was captured by a marauding tribe and sold to white slavers. And his extraordinary tale of capture and survival as one of the last slaves to be imported from Africa to the United States is history that deserves to be remembered. He didn't die until 1935. And he spoke about coming over here to America. He spoke about his experience on the slave ship. He spoke about his life in Africa. And he spoke about many others who could share the same story. He provided accounts of his life to a black journalist named Zora Neale Hurston. Cujo was only 19 years old when members of the Daomi tribe captured him and sold him into slavery. He spoke about how this was a regular thing. He spoke about how he's been expecting this for a while. On the night he was captured, men from the Daomi African tribe made their way into his home and they snatched him up. During this time, it was illegal to import slaves into the U.S. Go back and watch my videos on the Gullah Wars. Part one, the Gullah Wars. And part two is about the Stono Rebellion. And see why they really wanted to stop the importing of slaves. Most of the 115 Africans died on their way to the Americas. Many of them died due to hunger and disease. But Cujo survived. In a book called The Story of the Last Black Cargo, you can learn about his life in depth. So yeah, if you want to check this video uh, out and others like it, go to this guy's page.
Let me see. What's his page? name of his page? History with no chaser. Yeah, follow him. Subscribe to him. He's got all these stories. But I wanted to show you guys that just to get to the point that we were getting captured, killed, raped, pillaged by our own people. That's how we got here. A group of Europeans didn't show up with guns and bombs and threaten Africans. They came over and they made deals. Which means that our African brothers and sisters were completely complicit with what happened with, with the uh, transatlantic slave trade. So there we have it. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. This particular uh, segment of the live stream, mind you, like I said earlier, is in no way, shape or form meant to demean anyone from Africa, okay, or from the African continent. If anything, if anything, this is to give you delusional Negroes a wake up call. Western Africa sold off its greatest resources. They sold off its greatest resources to countries from other continents, from rival continents, in hopes of winning some imaginary uh, race for greed and material goods against their own neighboring tribes, only to make that other continent rich and ultimately rich enough to come back and take their shit. Now, fast forward to 2024. There ain't one single African nation with a nuclear weapon. There ain't one single African country in the G20 summit. Now, if you are familiar with that summit, it's basically a summit of, of, of about 20 countries that account for 80% of the global uh, GDP and 75% of all international trade. Those countries include Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Britain, Canada, China, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, I think Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, the US, and the countries that are in the uh, European Union. I may have left some out, but you get my drift. Ain't one African country in it. And you niggas wanna go back to Africa. You niggas want to go back to Africa to do what again? What do you want to do? Anyways, God bless America. <laughs> Trump 2024. Uh, look at my African-American over here. Look at him. <laughs> Are you the greatest? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right, man. Let's make it happen, man. Let's make it happen. Trump 2024. Anyway, what else we got here tonight? 